Okay, so I'm delighted to be joined today by Mike Bondiek, who's Chief Executive Officer at PTI Digital for this Digital Transformation webinar. Um, so Mike, before we get started, I thought it would just be a good idea for those people that don't know you, um, you know, sort of like, if you could just tell us a bit about your background. Like I know, for instance, when we met many, many moons ago, <laughs> you were CIO and head of IT, you know, busily um, overseeing the stadium migration at West Ham. Um, but I know there's been lots of things either side. So perhaps you can just tell everyone a bit about you. Yeah, sure. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me today, Katie. Uh, and thanks for everyone else for, for tuning in. Um, so yeah, I, I've, I've worked exclusively uh, in, in the sports industry um, now for sort of 17, uh, 17 years uh, in, in a variety of roles that would, would summary, in summary come towards being sort of digital transformation orientated roles. So uh, that experience is sort of bookended, uh, as you say, by two stadium transformations. The first one with Arsenal between Highbury and Emirates in, in the mid 2000s. Uh, and there um, I, I was sort of looking after platforms as we, they were called at the time, you know, a couple of years prior to the iPhone uh, coming out and building, uh, building websites that would allow us to transact uh, across a, a multiple um, set of revenue streams, for example, we were going from uh, 10 tours a week to 10 tours a day. Uh, we were going from 400 covers on a match day to 4,000. Uh, and without adding headcount into a contact center, how could we do that, uh, what would now, I guess, be called digitally, uh, to allow customers to self-serve, us to manage our staff and resources and, and pull those things together. So uh, they're sat within the commercial department, uh, helping them to unlock revenue opportunities using technology at the time. Uh, and as you say, uh, at the most recently before um, starting PTI, um, I was at West Ham uh, doing a similar job, but on a broader remit, uh, looking after everything from the infrastructure in the building uh, at London Stadium, out in across the 10 West Ham sites, including the training grounds, the stores, and a variety of others, uh, and then looking at their, their digital and consumer-facing products uh, as well. And obviously, over the last 18 months, um, digital and technology has all come to the fore. And, you know, a lot of people would say, you know, perhaps the whole landscape has fast forwarded, you know, eight, maybe more years. Um, but, you know, the term sort of digital transformation, um, which obviously is the title of the webinar, has become very much a buzzword um, in the industry. Um, but when it comes to what it actually means, what it actually does, you know, why sports teams um, and uh, sports and entertainment clubs and teams need to understand it and embrace it, perhaps you can just, you know, give us a bit of a, a, an overview as to that. Yes, absolutely. I think, um, I think firstly, uh, COVID has done two things. So, as you say, it's definitely accelerated the industry, but I think it's actually forced it to catch up. Uh, I think that's probably a more important point because when you look at digital platforms, consumer experience in a wider lens, uh, and you think to Amazon uh, and configurability there and one-click baskets and, and multiple baskets, multiple products, different delivery addresses, et cetera, et cetera, and consumer convenience that has really come out of wider world activities previously. Sport has been a long way behind that. Uh, for quite a long period of time. I think COVID really laid that bare, um, particularly when you look at things like ticketing systems uh, or wider items there where people are suddenly like, well, firstly, we're not selling tickets anymore, but now we need to be able to refund uh, tickets. We need to credit tickets. We need to roll forward. We need to create loyalty points. We need to do a whole variety of things that probably weren't as commonplace as they ought to have been um, prior to the pandemic hitting. Um, so there's been a rapid catching up uh, and now for, for certain clubs and venues, sort of as the shooting stars at the top, there's been that real acceleration uh, over the top of that to get going. But as you say, the uh, digital is almost a bit of a dirty word um, in, in, in many ways, which is probably a strange thing to say, given it's the title of my company. Uh, but um, uh, the challenge is really that it means too many things to too many people. Uh, in, in some places, digital can mean social media. Uh, when people say, yeah, we're really digitally advanced, that means they're on TikTok. Um, whereas for others, when they say digital, uh, they mean uh, a mobile app, for example. And we're doing digital. We have got a great digital landscape because we've got this wonderful app that's doing all these things in our venue. Uh, for other people, digital transformation in wider industry, i.e. if you're in financial services or 
education, digital transformation, it really means IT transformation. And they're, they're thinking more about how they're moving to hybrid working and how cloud services are allowing us to do things like this webinar today. Uh, and, and, you know, this could just as easily be a, a classroom environment uh, with, with two people sort of giving a lecture. Um, so in, in different contexts, digital means a lot of different things. So actually the thing that we found quite interesting, I think across 2020 and even into early 21, was just trying to educate the industry as to what digital transformation actually meant in our view. Uh, and in our view, it, it's relatively straightforward. It's about three things primarily. Um, firstly, it's about helping um, sports and entertainment businesses transition from being 20 to 30 day a year event businesses into 365 engagement lifestyle media businesses. Uh, and we've seen um, a prolific amount of content um, uh, being generated be the athlete first, be that from a club point of view, as people are trying to engage audiences on a longer term play, ultimately unlocking direct to consumer um, revenue streams and and the future of where sport comes comes on to, which I'll which I'll come back to. Secondly, it's about diversifying revenue streams. Um, the the problem for a lot of sports rights holders, again, particularly through the pandemic, is your traditional inelastic products were no longer available to you. You couldn't sell tickets, you couldn't sell hospitality, you couldn't sell a hot dog and a pint. Uh, and traditionally, if you take out sponsorship as a, a as a media play, um, you didn't really have any other major consistent revenue streams in the business. So of course, there was a panic uh, as, the, as the pandemic hit, uh, and not only hit, but sort of became a, a bigger deal, particularly across sort of Q220, um, where uh, if we remember back, you know, the Premier League uh, only first went off for three weeks. They were suspended for three weeks initially when that when the when the first decision was made, uh, and so for for March 2020, there was quite a lot of sort of ostriching, uh, and we'll stick our head in the sand. We'll be back in three weeks. That'll all be fine. Not to worry. As you got to sort of late April, early May, and the realization this was going to be with us for a long period of time was starting to sink in. Suddenly, it was a so how are we actually going to generate revenue? Um, because we've now furloughed a lot of staff, we've cut our costs back as much as we can, we've applied for the grants we're eligible for, what next? Uh, and so digital transformation really plays a role into that, not only through the lens of the pandemic, but of course to build sustainable revenues moving forwards. And then it's about the efficiency uh, from an operational point of view, uh, about how many of the processes that people are running within the business um, in, in, in a variety of departments are just woefully inefficient uh, and manual and uh, but human orientated, uh, they can be automated to make our life as, as sort of workers in the industry better uh, and therefore um, more efficient and more effective for the consumers front of house. So the quick summary of that being transitioning from um, event day businesses into media and lifestyle businesses, generating new and diverse revenue streams and then creating greater operational efficiency than you've ever really had in the business. That's our view of what digital transformation should achieve uh, and deliver in the context of a sports or entertainment business. And then perhaps you can also talk us through, obviously, PTI has the digital transformation pyramid, um, you know, which obviously takes in commercial growth, operational efficiencies, um, and everything in between. But perhaps you can just give us a bit more of a broader overview, um, you know, as to everything that comes within that. Yeah, sure. I'll just share my screen uh, very briefly, just to put that up um, so that everyone can can see it. Hopefully, that has uh, uh, come through okay um, uh, on the uh, on the webinar. Um, but yeah, I guess what what I was just talking about there is really sort of summarised to, to some extent in the in the context of the pyramid here. And this was really our way of um, summarising how and what of digital transformation to help contextualise digital transformation within a strategic lens. What we see very often, and you know, COVID has, has certainly driven people to this, is people are very quick to rush to what we would describe as the what, uh, i.e. when that CEO um, you know, turned around in, in April or May 2020 and said, so how are we going to generate revenue? What are we going to do? Uh, you know, people rushed to quick, dirty uh, answers. I, ah, I'll tell you what we don't have. We don't have an app. Uh, so let's get an app. That will be a nice silver bullet. That will save us a load of load of time and other stuff. And it'll be a new product we can launch and therefore we can uplift some sponsorship value into there or we can help to try and sell some, some retail through there or uh, whatever else it might be in that type of, um, in that type of an approach. Uh, but really, without understanding contextually or strategically how that uh, app, which would fall under the digital engagement tier um, on, the, on the pyramid you're seeing in front of you, is going to help you 
to deliver data, how it's going to fit into your commercial strategy, what that means from a marketing strategy perspective, back into the business. And then is that going to work when you come to a venue, i.e. is the Wi-Fi sufficient, is the cellular coverage sufficient? So when you say, aha, I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll go digital ticketing uh, or we'll go click and collect food and beverage. So excellent. When they come to your venue, will that actually work? Well, we haven't thought about that was typically typically the answer. So what we're trying to do here it is really, as we say at the top, the top um, shamelessly stolen from Simon Sinek, is that start with why. Why are we doing any of this? What does that really mean for you as a business? And what we see often is there's a big gap um, between the macro vision of a sports or entertainment business and the micro behaviours that staff will exhibit on a day-to-day -day basis. So, uh, for example, um, someone will be say, we want to grow participation in our sport by 25% over the next three years. Excellent. So good, good, lofty goal. Um, all the right sorts of, uh, sort of rhetoric um, contained, therefore, within. What does that mean for the marketing director of that business? Um, does that mean that they need to be empowering the brand uh, and, and the brand strategy side of things to create more relevance to broader audiences? Does that mean youth? Um, does that mean recruiting lookalike members to those that you already have? Where is that growth going to come from? How do we reach those audiences? And therefore, what tools do you need to do that uh, would be the best way for, from our point of view of approaching it. So you could have gone, we want to grow by 25% and therefore app is an answer because that helps us to reach a broader audience or social, a new social channel that's going to help us reach a broader audience. And that should therefore, on a traffic sales conversion funnel, we get 100,000 people at the bottom of the, of the funnel and 3,000 of them might end up playing the sport. Um, so, so let's go generic rather than say, well, what, who are those 3,000? What do we think they're going to be able to do? What value can we generate from them? And then work backwards to understand how and where we're going to target those individuals. The second target, that, uh, or challenge rather, that we often see, uh, which is contained in the commercial services pyramid right at, the, right at the top here, is that commercial strategy often drives marketing strategy in a sports and entertainment environment. And what I mean by that is a commercial target will be you know, we've got a 25,000 seat stadium, we're selling 20,000 tickets, there's therefore 5,000 tickets left. So commercially, we want to use that spare inventory. Uh, and as a result, the marketing efforts become, how do we sell the extra 5,000 tickets? Uh, and so there's very little thought about brand, often very little thought about personalization to the consumers. It becomes a, a numbers game again of, great, we've been tasked with selling 5,000 tickets for the next weekend. Marketing have blasted uh, some paid social out, they've blasted out some native social, they've blasted out a couple of email campaigns uh, and a splash page on the website. Congratulations, everyone. We've sold the 5,000 tickets. Well done. Oh, wait, there's another match day next week. Let's do it all again. Uh, and that element of hamster wheeling uh, has been so prevalent in sport for, for, for so many years. Uh, and COVID, to an extent, helped to break down a few of those barriers and challenge people to think about, well, what do we stand for? If we don't stand for selling tickets because we couldn't sell any, what do we stand for? What do we communicate about? Uh, and ultimately, what we see, therefore, is that marketing strategy ought to uh, determine part of the commercial strategy. And the way that we summarize that within a digital transformation lens is stop selling the product you want to sell and sell the product that they want to buy. Um, and if we understand from a marketing point of view what our audiences are looking for, uh, naturally, you start that on a stronger foot uh, because your commercial strategy is then based around your audience. Uh, rather than having to collect an audience to buy a product you've already pre-decided is the right answer. Um, so again, back to the, uh, I guess back to the pyramid overall. All we're ever trying to do really with clients is help them to understand where, uh, where they sit on, on the pyramid scale, and we can measure them against that through our digital and data maturity tools uh, or our ecosystem mapping tools um, as, a, as a perspective. But fundamentally, we want to make sure that every layer within the pyramid can support the layers above it. Uh, and what that does importantly is bring value out of technology. And when we talk about technology in terms of venue tech at the bottom of this, we're talking about what might be described as classic IT uh, and infrastructure in buildings. So that might be a firewall, that might be a core network switch and things that fundamentally the CEO, the board, the marketing director care little about. Um, they can't see them, they can't touch them. They've got one already. They don't understand why they need a new one. Um, because they're, they're typically run in isolation. Uh, however, when you put it through, uh, through this filter, as you say on the right-hand side, it helps us to prioritise investment needs because we'll be saying, okay, well, if we want to deliver an app 
uh, into the stadia, which is going to be sticky with people as a result of it having digital ticketing within it uh, and it having click and collect food and beverage options within it, for example, as two key kind of transactional uh, elements that most people will, will look to. We might want a firewall that allows us to block um, particular sponsor um, rivals or competitors, as we're saying to that sponsor, we know a lot about our audience. Everyone who comes into the building has got this app, and we're going to give you guaranteed access to X period per percentage of the audience uh, on a personalized basis based on people who are likely to buy your, buy your product. Through that lens, a marketing director, a commercial director, a, a CEO can better understand why an investment in a firewall is going to actually bring them some commercial return and how they're going to see a true ROI on that. Uh, as opposed to a classic IT director having to go into a boardroom to say, I need to fight for some budget and then being seen as a cost center. Uh, and ultimately, if we can get these, um, these layers to support the ones um, that are on, on top of it, we can guarantee the match day experience will, will deliver what, is, what has been promised. Uh, we will start to see the benefits in the engine room around data and digital and how we're collecting, using, personalizing and driving spend ahead. And ultimately, that's going to help us achieve our commercial targets. So really what it's about is just helping people to have a, a, a really simple one page, one slide framework that, that from the boardroom down to sort of junior executives can look at and understand how and why these things link together and that the output of all of these is digital transformation. There's no point changing the firewall if you're not going to layer clever services on top of it. There's no point putting an app in unless you put the firewall in to allow it to maximize its benefit. And there's no point doing any of that if you haven't understood why you're delivering that from a commercial brand marketing or, or just fundamental business strategy perspective. And then, you know, how can sort of digital transformation actually unlock some of the assets that perhaps clubs or entities not necessarily have overlooked, but, you know, perhaps undervalue um, and then obviously make those assets, you know, sort of... Um, uh, well, to create them into sort of stable um, and high margin revenue models. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's probably a couple of, of key ways. Uh, I think when we think of a traditional perspective, we'd probably be looking uh, around how spend per head can be uplifted from an app venue um, point of view by virtue of knowing more about our customers, be that through where they've arrived um, and, and geolocating through to what types of things they're doing when they're in the stadium to if they're connected to a Wi-Fi solution, for example, what else are they looking at? What types of apps are they using? Uh, how, is that being, how is that being perceived? So we can create digital personas that would allow us to say, ah, we think Katie's got a higher propensity to want to upgrade her ticket to premium than Mike, and hence we're going to push her a notification as she comes in uh, because we can see she's coming two hours early. Uh, we know that she probably isn't going to want to stand on a concourse that's quite cold for the full two hours through to kickoff, so we're going to try and find a way to uplift her experience on a personalized basis, uh, but therefore also generate new revenue streams. And that is being fundamentally delivered by the underlying connectivity, the infrastructure that you're now connected to, the digital engagement we have with you and the data that we're collecting um, about you, enabling us to, to better personalize your experience when you come to the venue. So I guess that's a very traditional linear path um, that people can start to take where they'll see pretty immediate and, and tangible results. Of course, our case studies with the likes of Edgefaston from the test match over the, over the summer Talk to a talk to a lot of those a lot of those points. I think what sports really waking up to now is the direct to consumer world that is uh, that, that is around it. It's been there for for quite some time, but largely ignored. Uh, partly because of the challenge that I alluded to earlier, i.e., there are five thousand tickets still to sell for Saturday. Till we've done that, we can't get our head above water. Oh wait, there's next Saturday, uh, and round and round you go until you've uh, until you've exhausted yourself at the end of the season. Everyone needs a good holiday. Um, now the challenge that a lot of rights holders had. As, as COVID hit, when they looked at their database, was they really only knew transactors. Uh, and within that, they really only knew ticket purchases in any, in any real depth. So uh, I guess the, the hierarchy um, of, of sort of football club, if we take that as the, the example, uh, football club data was ticketing data goes first. We want to know as much as we do about our season ticket holders because they're a big revenue stream. We do a lot of propensity modeling with those as, as clubs. Um, and we tend to think about season ticket holders as sort of the holy grail. Someone who's then buying match by match tickets and has got some form of membership affiliation um, is, is critical in the next phase. And then people who've bought retail. Uh, now, some people might have gone into looking at um, food and beverage and trying to combine that into a, a, a very junior uh, or basic single customer view. But actually what we were missing is everyone else that the club has touched in some capacity or way. 
uh, and what sport has been pretty poor at um, is if someone hasn't gone down a traditional um, conversion cycle for a particular product, uh, they will just disavow them. Um, so if I've registered on the website for a newsletter, and I've all I've done is put my email address in, uh, and then I sort of get sent five newsletters, and I only read one of them, I'm basically deemed as unimportant uh, as a piece. Now, when we talk about direct to consumer, and we talk about that through the lens of the definition of digital transformation and that move from event-based businesses into media businesses, suddenly the context of those ticket sales is slightly less important. Uh, and actually what we're looking at there is broadening the funnel of people we're talking to based on the relevancy uh, of the products and services that we can offer to them. So back to the point about sell what they want to buy rather than what you want to sell. And that ticketing example will be a classic example of that. Oh, only 20, at least 20% of our database has never bought a ticket, so we don't really communicate with them. Well, they're there for a reason. So they've clearly got some form of affiliation to your club, and that might be as simple as they bought their friend a Christmas present three years ago um, because they, they knew that they were an Arsenal fan. Uh, and they've logged on, they've logged onto the website, and they've bought a shirt uh, as a Christmas present. They've got no, no further contact from you. Well, actually, the fact that we know that they buy something for a friend uh, as a piece is a starting point to a conversation in much the same way that someone who's registered for the newsletter who's consuming lots of women's sports content, for example, can now be targeted with personalised information about the women's team. So, well, actually, maybe they don't care as much about the men's team, which is the general assumption that most sports digital folk make. What, what do they actually want when they're with us? Um, and, and what that unlocks is a, is a whole variety of new revenue opportunities. And I guess there's some... Uh, we, can, we can play digital buzzword bingo uh, at, uh, at this point with a, with a variety of these types of things. But if we start at the top, when we think about direct-to-consumer um, sponsorship, uh, you know, sponsorship has its problems in limitation by virtue of category exclusivity. So most clubs um, and sports event rights holders will still have a, you're the official um, car partner, you're the official watch partner, you're the official sports drink partner whatever it might be uh, in, in the context of that. And once you've got one, that's that. They're signed up for two or three years. That, that's your deal done. Of course, that product isn't relevant to everyone. Clearly, cars have a price bracket uh, that can range from uh, a couple of grand uh, for a second-hand car from, from, from somewhere local through to a six-figure sum for a brand new Range, Range Rover, uh, for example. So depending on where you've done your commercial deal above the line with rights that are media facing, you know, they might be on the LED, uh, they might be on the website, or they might be in solar emails, et cetera. When you do things above the line there, you can still do that deal. So we're not compromising uh, existing revenue streams that you have in the business. But if we're going to say that, that person X in a business um, yeah, on a database as a, as a potential fan of a club or a fan of the club and a known fan of the club. If we know that their earning bracket um, suggests to us that buying a six-figure car is, is likely never to be something that's high on their agenda or certainly not in the context of a three-year uh, sponsorship cycle, can we still sell them a car? Can we say to them, well, actually, because of the data enrichment works we've done, we know you've got a personal um, a PCP, you've got a plan coming up in the next six months we know that you spend broadly £200 a month on that. And here are a range of options from lower, uh, lower end car manufacturers that might suit you. Uh, and can we tailor that newsletter so that every category of person uh, in sort of buckets of data uh, in sort of price ranges get a different car advert in the context of the same newsletter? So from a club content point of view, they're getting pushed out to say, Yep, here's the manager's press conference, here's the highlights from last week, you know, all the classic stuff you would have there. But that banner ad or that ad in, 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 the, middle of that, um, in the middle of that video, uh, for example, is being tailored on a one-to-one -one personalized basis based on what we know of you as the consumer. Because, of course, from a brand point of view uh, and a sponsor point of view, they're, they're less fussed about the emotive connection um, between that, that fan and the club and whether they go 20 times a year, whether they watch it on TV, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. That's that's less relevant. What is more relevant to them now than ever is conversion and is loyalty. So when we think to a traditional sort of sponsorship measurement funnel, you'd start with awareness, um, and that's where you sort of challenger brands will use sports to say, "Hey, didn't you, you know about us now because you've seen us on the LED or you've seen us on the front of the football shirt and we've got loads of media exposure? Great." Uh, they'll then go up into consideration. So I've, I've now seen that brand a lot of times. Who are they? What do they do? I've now popped to their website. And traditional above-the-line um, sponsorship deals often stop there 
in terms of their value to the brand because it's just driving people into their ecosystem. If something then happens, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And most people will do their media reports at the end of the year and say, you've got 10 million pounds worth of media value for a million quids worth of spend. Therefore, you've got a 10 to 1 ROI. That's brilliant. Of course, as we come out of COVID, um, that, that rarely works for either party. We've got dwindling attendances across leagues, uh, really low density um, of, of people actually attending, even based on ticket sales to actual attendance, uh, as it stands at the moment. And of course, those same brands and those same sponsors have been hit by the same pandemic that the rest of us have. Uh, so there's no point looking to them as the cash cows they maybe once were, um, particularly once you drop, drop outside sort of the, the, the top four or top six of the, of the Premier League. They still want people to then convert and, and drive loyalty into their brand. So if they've, if they've got a sale as a result of an email coming out of a, a football club to a email that was registered purely for a newsletter, but that we've enriched with from a data point of view and been able to understand more about what they might want. And that person buys the car or a season ticket holder of 40 years buys the car. They can care less. They're looking for the sale and they're looking for the ability to convert. So when we start to think about what the next exponential growth opportunities are for sports, imagine if you're able to partner with multiple brands per category uh, without compromising the above-the-line exclusivity-style deal of yesteryear, whilst also being able to prove from a data point of view and a digital point of view that you created a sale for that brand. Now, what the, what the sports industry is still quite poor at what a lot of other industries are not, i.e. automotive, retail, airlines, etc., is attribution modeling, where they'll simply be saying, you know, for one in, one in five people that come into our showroom who take a test drive, buy a car, and we know that to get, for one in, for, to get five test drives, we need 25 engaged leads, and to get 25 engaged leads, we need 100 people at the base of the funnel. Now, every time they could therefore say, you know, Club X as generators, 100 people, they will see the net return of that car sale as an average, as an average price in their ROI. Uh, and that's how they will be perceiving the value of that sponsorship. So if we can get ahead of that game as sports and bring all the other benefits that we know sports has in terms of emotive connection, long dwell times, constant touch points, uh, and a variety of things there, it matters little uh, to the consumer, uh, sorry, to the brand, whether that consumer has known you for a day, a week, a month, a year, a lifetime. It matters little to them whether they spent a pound, a ten, or a hundred, a thousand, or ten grand with you over that lifetime. If they're relevant to them, uh, and you can create relevancy to them, back to that marketing strategy and commercial uh, flip uh, into there, there's significant opportunities to be gained um, from a sports rights holder point of view in disaggregating sponsorship and allowing data to play uh, to play a classic role into that. For Sorry, carry on. No, I was just going to say the, the, the other um, two things that are obviously driving uh, a lot of interest uh, at the minute. Uh, I'm not going to go into fan tokens. So I'm just going to completely uh, ignore crypto uh, and some of the challenges that's creating um, uh, for, for, for this piece. But I guess the, uh, the elements around OTT uh, and the ability to go direct to consumer with content, be that either at league rights holder level or be that an individual club with content shows and and wider pieces, we've got lots of uh, clients who are thinking about things like fitness, um, fitness brands or sub brands under, the, under their club, train with the players, exclusive content, subscription models, push that content out. Again, lifestyle brand um, thinking, media business thinking, creating wider relevance to a wider audience of people who might not want to come and watch you know, rugby on a Saturday afternoon, but actually training like a rugby player uh, is interesting to them or to their family or to their children, uh, etc., and working back through there. Um, so OTT is uh, uh, via the direct-to-consumer model, a, a, a nice linchpin to then create other monetization opportunities around the fact that people are now watching your content rather than watching the content, uh, i.e. it's great that they're watching live on Sky Sports and you've got a little bit of, um, uh, you've got a little bit of coverage for your sponsors in the ads that you've got or on the LED um, that you've got at, at pitch side. But if they're watching your content, you control the whole journey. Uh, as an element for within that, we get to learn a lot about the people. Uh, we get to understand interests and, and, and derive that scale from, from data. But then that also gives us the opportunity to upsell things like NFTs as the, as the next buzzword uh, on, on the bingo uh, on the bingo go merry go round um, within that context. I think that is probably an area that is going to mature much more rapidly um, because people have started to get their head around what digital ownership might mean for souvenirs, for experiences, and for a wider 
uh, a wider range of activities. Um, and again, it just comes down to diversifying the products into the things that the consumer wants to buy rather than that which you want to sell. And that's the big mindset shift for the industry is saying, actually ticketing whilst the complete core revenue stream right now, is that going to be the case in five years' time? How many more people are going to keep coming and keep coming and keep coming? How, or how, many, how much more can we do to keep you know, funneling people in? Because we're, we're about to hit the generational uh, challenges uh, of people who've grown up with technology, uh, who you were used to choice, we're used to configurability. Um, and in Stadia, unless we can keep up with that uh, from an in-venue point of view, back to the overarching pyramid and the base and the foundations that we, we talk about so often and are, and are so important, uh, then we're going to lose that generation unless we've got better relevance to them. Uh, and that comes from that transition from event business to media business. And, you know, sort of Mike, taking that a step forward, you know, it, it, it's amazing how, you know, sort of all different, you know, you always used to be, but it was just, you know, you looked at the sports and entertainment sector and what they were doing um, to sort of drive the business. But nowadays, you know, Everyone seems to be looking to hotels, to retail, to what the airlines are doing and everything in between. Um, you know, so what trends um, or what technologies um, uh, uh, do you foresee, you know, sort of being able to translate um, and transcend into the sports and entertainment sector to sort of, you know, it even enhance what we're doing and that whole data collection piece. Uh, and like you say, being a potential driver for, for the younger generation. Yeah, I think there's probably two key answers to that. Um, I'm not sure how your household was through lockdown, but mine was full of cardboard as Amazon delivered almost daily. Uh, to my house for a variety of things. And I think Amazon have got two things done, done beautifully. Clearly, they've got a lot of other uh, wonderful things in the background, but the two things I think to uh, most often, that single basket, one-click experience it is, so, is so straightforward for everyone to use, uh, combined with their ability, obviously, from a prime point of view to deliver things quickly. If it's Sunday at three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, I'm thinking from a UK perspective of most stores closing at four o'clock on a, on a Sunday, I can order it on a Sunday ahead of a bank holiday Monday, and it'll be with me early on the bank holiday Monday um, before the shops have even reopened. Um, so they've taken away a lot of the pain that the consumers actually had from a high street point of view around availability, be that stock uh, or be that opening hours, and said, right, we're basically on 24-7 a day, uh, or 24-7, uh, and we sell everything. We are your one-stop shop. If you want um, some garden furniture or you want a book, uh, or you want a piece of tech, or you want a new digital camera, or you want a laptop, or anything in between, you can put all of that in one basket and we'll deliver it to you in one nice package. Uh, we'll save you going to five stores with five transactions, with five receipts, five sets of terms and conditions. We'll centralize all of that into one, one basket, one click, and it'll be with you tomorrow. Uh, and that is the type of convenience that we as consumers collectively have got used to. So when we look at that from a sports point of view, uh, and for some this may still seem quite utopian, but actually there's a number of clubs who are not far away from cracking the nuts. Why is it that I have to log into a ticketing system to buy the ticket, then into a retail system to buy the shirt, then into a tour system to pre-book my tour, then into a dining system to then say, I'd like to stay and have a meal after the match. Uh, when, when the wider world experience, uh, for both on Amazon, in upsells in Netflix or, or Disney Plus, or into air, airlines and their conversion funnels of, great, you bought the flight, would you like to upgrade baggage, a car? Uh, would you need a hotel with that? Do you need a transfer from the airport? Do you need a blah, blah, blah? Uh, All of these things in one place. Sports still hasn't really got its head around that. Uh, and actually that generational divide that we were talking about um, uh, earlier on really just associate with that. They've never experienced anything but that um, as they've come up into being sort of transacting credit card, debit card holding adults. They're just used to the convenience. We've got to find a way for sport to break that barrier in their head between, great, we've got a ticketing system and great, we've got a retail system and the retail team are happy and the ticketing team are happy, but actually the consumer is not. And that again comes back to that whole point of, well, we, we, that's, that's a step on, I guess, from the sell them what they want to buy rather than what you want to sell. The next step on is sell it to them the way they want to consume it rather than the way you want to package it um, as, as that deliverable there. The second one we started to talk about briefly there was just attribution modeling and understanding the role of data. 
you know, there are lots of people uh, for a number of years who've said, yeah, data is the new oil, got to capture more data. You know, I myself today have spent a lot of time talking about data uh, and the importance of it and how you might commercialize that uh, as an element. The challenge that CFOs have, CEOs have still, is what is the value of data? Because uh, you know, we might register 10,000 people onto a database and none of them might ever transact. Um, so that is a risk. I don't want to spend loads of money acquiring new customers of quality records for first party data unless I can see a clear business case. And again, that's where it's not used as the dark art of betting, uh, but a number of those types of industries have got great attribution modeling to say, as or when someone registers, it doesn't matter if they buy something in the first year or the second year, because we reckon they're worth, on average, or based on digital personas, let's say £30 over five years. So what we'll do in our P&Ls as an ROI is we'll put £6 per year for those five years. And when the transaction actually happens, we'll fold it all flat and we'll, we'll talk about actuals. But because we can see the type of data we're capturing, with so we're seeing what the equivalent lookalike data we already have is doing in that kind of category, we'll start to assume some value against that in its first phase. I think that's where we're seeing you know, a lot of OTT type um, products or subscription models, the rights holders starting to fall down as they look at the investment cost of putting a platform together and then look at the year one revenues um, and think, well, that doesn't make any money, so I can't do that because we're all cash strapped at the moment. Uh, and what, what sport will need to get over from that wider world perspective is that chicken and egg um, nature of it. Until you've built it based for your audience and all the things that they want, they're not going to get there um, to convert. And you'll need, that, um, you'll need that data in order for you to understand what they want and how they're going to get it delivered in order for you to build the platform. But without the platform, you won't understand how they're going to, how they're going to interact with it and what you're going to need to do because you haven't got the audience. Uh, and so there is, a, there is a classic chicken and egg uh, to go on there. I think the gap there is how we truly define value um, as a secondary piece, um, rather than um, us define that purely as pounds of pounds and pence. I spent a pound yesterday, when do I get one pound fifty back? Uh, it's going to need to fall away as a classic ROI mechanism. Great if you can get it, um, but particularly in a world post-COVID where funds are short, people being able to understand the longer term value uh, will be those people who really get ahead and, and unlock a lot of that scalable growth earlier um, than those who are sort of back and stuck in their hamster wheels. And then one, just before I ask you the, the, the last question, I was just going to say to all the uh, attendees, you know, if you've got any questions, start typing them into the chat now. Because um, when I ask, uh, uh, um, Mike, this last question um, will then go into a short Q and A section. So, uh, start firing ahead now uh, with your questions. But Mike, what I was going to say to you, obviously, is uh, with, with the business that I'm in, it's uh, you know sports venue business. So I'm regularly writing pieces, and I have to say, PTI has been keeping me very busy of late. <laughs> Very good. So, yeah, you know, you've had uh, the growing portfolio of clients with OVG, the Co-op Live, London Stadium, you know, the list goes on. And then you've been announcing and launching everything from, you know, obviously the PTI digital transformation pyri pyramid. We were just talking about the managed IT service. Um, the list goes on. And obviously, you know, you've also, throughout all of this, um, also been expanding into the Middle East, Australasia, etc. So perhaps you can just give us a brief overview um, as to, you know, where PTI began five years ago, where it is now. And I can only imagine what you've got in the pipeline um, on, and ideas for the next uh, you know, sort of a few years. Yeah, look, it's been a it's been a busy but very productive time. Uh, I'm personally very happy with it, and the team have done some some incredible work with a number of the clients you've just uh, you've just referenced there, which helps us to ultimately grow. You know, this is a very small and tight knit industry, uh, and so uh, we rely on having great people in our team and, and that growing team to deliver excellent work and outcomes and make sure that we're. Uh, delivering that pyramid uh, that we were talking about there. Um, but yeah, I guess as a business, we've got probably two two key mentalities. Uh, the first one is that we'll fail fast and learn fast. Um, you, know, you can't work with innovation, be that literally in terms of the um, the technology side of the business, uh, or be that um, you know, or be that collectively as a as a young um, startup business uh, without buggering the odd thing up. 
Um, and so our, our mechanisms there aren't about not trying things. It's about trying things, but understanding how quickly we can measure their success or their failures and therefore moving on with the things that are being successful. The second thing uh, in terms of sort of the business direction is that we're always trying to answer the question we believe the client will ask next before they've asked it. Um, and as you look at how we've evolved from initially in the venue tech space, uh, kind of at the bottom of the pyramid, up into the data and digital space, then up again into the commercial services space, that really reflects that mentality and ethos uh, of us saying, great, we've now put great technology infrastructure in, but how are you going to leverage it uh, using digital and data? And now that that's in place, how are you going to commercialize it? And ultimately taking that step for that step forwards with people. But I think the thing that we've, we've done uh, over the last 12 months, really, is just help to demystify and just simplify what digital transformation is and how you can get started with it without having to break the bank, change absolutely everything about your club, your venue, um, or your sort of estate, um, but do so through that strategic framework in order for you to build value, um, not just in the one project that you might be doing, i.e. a mobile app project, but doing that through the lens of where you're going as a client, therefore helps you to build longer term, sort of some of its parts, multiples, um, that enable clients to engage uh, at a relatively low level, test it and see some of the results and then grow as they see those. Uh, and I think that's, that's a really big uh, and important point, really, because there are yeah, a number of digital skeptics um, still sort of remaining in, in the industry. Uh, and, and to some of them, rightly so. Um, you know, there, are, there are probably three buckets uh, of challenge there. You've got a lot of um, people who've been in the industry a long time. Uh, who were here for, I guess, the first coming of technology or the first coming of digital uh, into the 2000s, into the early 2010s, where it didn't actually work all that well. Uh, you know, where stadium Wi-Fi was a very expensive mistake on, on the most part for, for a number of businesses. So that guy who might have been um, you know, an IT manager or that girl who might have been an IT director at that time, who's now a CTO, who's thinking, hmm, not, not so convinced on this. I need that proven to me. Uh, or likewise, a marketing director who put an app in in 2010 when all it could really do was be a replica of the website is probably thinking, no, I don't really understand how that's going to fit into my into my estate. So once they can do a single project against that um, strategic filter of what we're doing and how it's going to build value for the longer term, and they can see some short term results, we just generate that confidence that this can happen. Um, so I guess that's bucket one. Bucket two is then there is so many buzzwords out there. Let's say AR, VR, NFTs, crypto, fan coins, etc., floating around that it just feels really confusing. Um, and we have, which one do we invest into? Which one's safe and secure? Uh, you know, you've had the Squid Game, um, uh, the Squid Game coin collapse the other day after lots of people got suckered in by the fact that something that was very popular on Netflix now had an investment opportunity. Who would have thought that would have gone wrong? Um, but there's, um, you know, there's things like that floating around. Uh, and then there's, there's not a huge number of people who've broken the back of the getting out of the hamster wheel in the boardroom uh, who are saying, well, that's great. You know, I want that long term value. But have we sold those 5000 tickets? And the, the management of those clubs is challenging their sort of director level positions and downwards to make sure they're still doing that. Um, so I say our job really has been just to work between those lines, help people to get on their journey and roadmap out what a longer term strategy might look like so they can take steps today without thinking, uh-oh, you know, in two years' time, I'm going to have to rip and replace that, and all that investment's going to go down the drain. Uh, and if we can just help the, the industry start on that journey, ultimately we're helping them from a spend efficiency point of view, helping people to take their first steps on, on digital transformation as a, as a journey, but actually proving the value of it as, a, as an outcome. Uh, well, uh, typically, uh, everyone's gone very quiet. There, there's no questions uh, coming in, but uh, it, it's part of the course. I think everyone's gone a bit very shy after the last uh, two years of not being at in-person <laughs> events. Um, but uh, what, what I'm sure, obviously, anyone can email me um, with any questions for Mike, and I can put you in contact. So katie at sportsvenuebusiness.com. Um, all it leaves me to say is thank you so much, Mike. If there are any final thoughts you wanted to round the session off with, you know, feel free. Uh, yeah, I, I think that a phrase I often use, which I also often trip my tongue up on, so if I get it wrong, bear with me, um, when it comes to digital transformation, is that you don't have to be an expert to start, but in order to become an expert, you must first start. Uh, and I think that's what people lose themselves behind. We haven't got anyone in the business who can understand this or do it properly, or we're going to invest this money. We need to be experts. We need to do this. Well, 
you don't. You need to get yourself moving in a direction to start you learning and iterating. And if we iterate enough times, we actually create that transformational outcome. So um, be brave uh, on, the, on, on, the, on the journey that we were sort of talking about there. Take your first steps and you'll, you'll start to see those rewards. I think never a truer word has been said, you know, definitely be brave. Um, you know, I think it's gone in the days when everyone waited to let someone else go first uh, and try it out. You know, so many clubs and sports and entertainment entities now are willing to take that first step and be the first to try something and do what? something. I think what people have realised, this is a closing thought on that, is that they need a point of differentiation. Now, there was a, a football club we used to work with whose spend approval form started with which other comparable clubs of about our size are already doing this because they didn't want to, they didn't want to invest into innovation. They wanted to play it safe. Mm -hmm. uh, now, perfectly fine as a, you know, as, as a thought process, if you've only got limited budget and you only want to invest into there. But of course, it then means that when you get there, you haven't got anything unique to sell you haven't got a unique story to sell to your consumers or to your sponsors. Uh, and you've got the same thing that someone else claims is innovation three years prior. Uh, now, as we come out of COVID and we're talking about that need to unlock direct consumer revenues and that transition from event business into media business, if you give away your media business ideas by trying to copy the club next door, uh, I know club one does, does a fitness video, so club two does a fitness video. Well, actually too late, people have moved and found other places that did it first and they've subscribed to it. Uh, and so I think that is a, a general trend that people have suddenly realised that actually going first and that fail fast, almost fail fast, learn fast mentality has more upside than it has ever done now coming out of COVID. Well, thank you, Mike. That was a very Pleasure. informative uh, 45 minutes. Um, oh, yeah, we've had, uh, oh, yeah, Claire Hughes from End to End says, being very interesting. Uh, End to End was brave and are doing best to be pioneers in this um, space. Um, oh, and I think she'd like to speak to you, Mike. So I'll put <laughs> the two of you uh, in contact. I think there could be some synergies there. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, looking forward to seeing you in person. It's been way too long. And uh, yeah, uh, anyone with any questions, just send them over to me and I shall forward them on to Mike for you. So thanks, thanks very much, everyone. Take care.